Hello and welcome everyone to tonight's ACIP webinar, Comprehensive Physician and Practice Resuscitation Training. I would now like to pass the floor over to our first speaker for tonight, Dr. Laksmaya Manchikanti. Dr. Manchikanti, if you're ready, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Trevor. Uh, I welcome everyone for this uh, webinar again. Uh, we are so sorry that it happened inconvenience to so many of us. Uh, as Trevor stated, that it was out of control. So with that, we want to go for what we are doing today and see how we can proceed with this. Uh, we, this, this webinar has uh, my introduction, of course, then Amol will speak about overview of ACIP activities. Shalini Shah is going to show us uh, get, how to get back to normal. They have been working very hard on this uh, topic and they came up with some interesting uh, data. Revenue cycle management, farming on IPA, marketing during a recession. And then we will have open forum discussion and Dr. Devi will be participating in that. If you have questions, you can send for her. We will be, she will be happy to answer them. So we are so honored to have her here. Uh, thanks for partial funding from Boston Scientific. There are some issues going on here. There are some good news and some news we are still waiting on. Amol is going to share some of those with you. There are too many things, too much of confusion going on. Like Arkansas, John Swicegood sent me this, uh, all asymptomatic patients should be tested negative within 48 hours before you do any procedures. This is the state which did not have a lockdown. We are trying to figure out what that means. Asymptomatic patients means all Arkansas people or the ones who had the COVID infection or corona infection. Now we are also hearing that opioid, opioids are not available. Uh, even though DEA has increased their production before they used to cut down the production for the last three, four years, they have been reducing the production or four years, I think, every year. This year, they permitted them to increase it by 25%, but unfortunately, you can't buy them. Patients are not getting opioids. We have been informed in Paducah that OxyContin may not be available ever again. Oxycodone won't be available for a few weeks. So going from there, we all have our own opinions and everybody is entitled to his own opinion, but not his own facts. Like Daniel Patrick Monahan said, now we have all these issues going on throughout the states. Every state is behaving themselves. Of course, states have their own autonomy and it is really confusing everyone. As you look at that table, there are several states with stay-at-home orders still going on. It's amazing that there are few states which say that until further notice. Then some of them have limits up to May 4th. We received a <coughs> directive from Illinois governor. The way I understood was that he's tightening the regulations until next 30, May 30th. But if you read it, it says that I was interpreting that we can start elective surgeries if there is enough PPE and hospital has the capacity to hold them. It is all really confusing. So we need to work through these issues as we go through. In reference to the proposed phased approach, we have to mitigate the risk, protect the most vulnerable and implementation statewide or county by county. That is what I was focusing on. Testing and contract training, contact training, healthcare system capacity and plans. So they have these directions for individuals, all vulnerable individuals, individuals when in public, avoid socializing of course, minimize non-essential travel. Continue encourage telework. That means they are asking us 
even do the telephone visits continuously, even if we return to work. If possible, return to work in phases, if they still are in business. Minimize non-essential travel, special accommodations, again, vulnerable populations. Elective surgeries, they can resume as clinically appropriate on an outpatient basis at facilities that adhere to CMS guidelines. That is the CMS. And at the same time, schools and organized youth activities, they should remain closed. So it creates a problem for people. They don't have daycare. They don't have camps. But they can't go to the work either because of those. They classify vulnerable individuals as elderly, individuals with serious underlying health conditions. We will hear a lot more about that. Uh, Shalini is going to talk about those things. In this, we already had four of these, and last one was with two CME hours. And you have our contact addresses for ASIP and LinkedIn. Please join them. This is the same thing. This is the next time we are going to have next one. The speakers and subject is mentioned there. It is there. And on May 5th, Tuesday, we didn't have schedule when we sent this, but we are going to have Senator Cassidy to come and talk to us, and you can ask him the questions. Then Dr. Devi will be talking. We will have a lecture on time management. And we will also have Sunny Jaw speaking about young physicians. And here is the information for you available, coronavirus made simple. So a long time ago, Winston Churchill said, a nation that forgets its past has no future. The same thing applies to a society, an individual, and a family member, and everyone. So we need to remember where we came from. Now, Amol is going to talk about some of the ASIP activities and proceed from there. Amol? Yes, thank you. Hello, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about um, an overview of some of ASIP activities and the value of ASIP membership, particularly during the COVID-19 crisis. Um, so as you can see, on April 23rd, we released uh, some breaking news um, you know, uh, about uh, COVID-19. And in particular, um, there's a lot of things that are happening, particularly with the CARES Act, in terms of distributions uh, into your accounts. And as you know, you guys um, in the past have gotten a 6.1 disp distribution based on the previous year's Medicare. Um, indications are that there would be another distribution coming. And that's what the breaking news um, was talking about initially. Um, just to go over some of ASIP's top 10 achievements that you all know, um, Interventional Pain Management was a specialty on the Carrier Advisor Advisory Committee, and that allows us to formulate local coverage designations, which has been very helpful for us as we advocate for you. Um, we have the Pain Physician Journal and a second journal as well, uh, uh, publishing pain medicine uh, case reports. Uh, NASPER, the National Prescription Database, um, was something that ASIP really spearheaded, and specialty designations in interventional pain management. We've noticed practice expenses increasing for interventional pain management over the past several years, and ASIP has been working to increase your fee schedules. And multiple times on multiple occasions, we've seen an increase in office-based and surgery, uh, surgical center-based uh, reimbursements. And in an age of declining reimbursements, it's very helpful to have ASIP on our side. Um, you can see the other uh, achievements there, but for the sake of time, I'm going to move on. Um, another thing that ASIP has done is um, provided a definition of interventional uh, pain management. And you can see that there for the diagnosis and treatment of pain-related disorders, um, and particularly the application of interventional techniques. And then, of course, the definition of uh, interventional pain management techniques that you can see there about placement of drugs in targeted areas. Now, these types of things are important for us as we uh, advocate for our techniques and technologies to be utilized. Another thing that's happening here, um, you can see the um, here the CMS manual from Program Integrity about the inclusion of interventional pain management specialties in the Carrier Advisory Committee. So ASIP now has 50 state societies, and as a result, we have a CAC member on each state uh, to represent us and our interests, which is very helpful. Um, in fact, ASIP is the pretty much the only specialty advocating in that uh, in that realm at this point. Um, 
through the CAC committees. Uh, and the uh, various state societies, ASIP state societies, are the ones that have the power and jurisdiction to uh, appoint the CAC members. It's very um, helpful and important. So as we move on, uh, we know we also have a specialty board, ABIP. Uh, it's a board certification in interventional pain management. Uh, we also have competency certifications in interventional pain management, endoscopic decompression, regenerative medicine, coding compliance, fluoroscopy. Also, ABIP has been active with various state medical boards. In fact, I'm from Ohio, as you all know, um, and Ohio uh, actually recognizes the ABIP boards as one of the boards to become uh, a licensed and certified uh, pain management physician in the state. So in the state of Ohio, they passed a rule and regulation that requires you to have a board certification to market and license yourself as a pain practice, and the uh, ABIP board is one of those. And in fact, there are several states now that recognize ABIP uh, to advertise that they are board certified. There's 13 of them. Um, there's 11 states that actually have no statutes governing specialty boards. Uh, there's one that does case-by-case -case determination, that's Oklahoma, and, and the rest of the states are pending that you see down there. Um, so moving on here, um, actually ASIP has a group pur purchasing organization that offers better supplies and uh, prices and creates added value to your practice. And you can see the link on the bottom if you're interested in joining a group purchasing. Uh, obviously, a penny saved is a penny earned, as we heard you know many times that adage from coined by Brain Franklin, I believe, in the beginning. Uh, but uh, that's something to think about, you know, as far as uh, purchasing. Um, there's a specific vignette that you can see in the text there about Omnipake. Um, and you know how you're able to save money, but there's there's several ways you can save money through that specific program. Uh, Department of Health and Human Services uh, and CDC has uh, issued a request for comment for management of acute and chronic pain. Uh, what I'm going to do today is ask all of you guys, um, and especially the state presidents and state leaderships of the various ASIP societies, uh, to consider uh, commenting on this. The comments are due June 1st. Um, actually, it says June 16th there. Uh, and you can see on the slide that lists um, how and where to comment. Uh, on a side note, I'm going to be reaching out to all of the state presidents um, here in the next week or two and giving you instructions on uh, how to comment and uh, some suggestions to comment. The state of Ohio actually created a work group, and we're actually working on our prepared comment, uh, state-specific, uh, about the management of acute and chronic pain. And this is our uh, ability now to uh, provide guidance to the Center for Disease Control and HHS, so we really need to have a strong voice there. Here's some sample letters that you see just regarding uh, to show some of the advocacy that we do. Um, Dr. Machikani and uh, others have written letters. Here's one to Seema Verma about requesting extension of telehealth visits through uh, August 6th. Um, and you can see here, uh, here's another letter to Secretary Azar and Honorable uh, Secretary Eric uh, Hogan there um, talking about um, patient care and patient access. Um, and here's actually a response we got uh, from CMS, particularly regarding how you pay back the uh, loan that you get, the Medicare Advance loan. Uh, we had some requests about uh, recouping the payment at 50% of new claims to repay as opposed to 100% and to extend the date uh, longer. Uh, the response was actually, um, it wasn't negative, <laughs> which is a good thing. It says CMS is working with our general counsel to determine if this recommendation is within our existing authorities and we'll consider it uh, if they have authority, which would be um, hopefully good for us. So we'll continue to follow up on that. Um, ASIP liability insurance collaboration with NorCal Mutual, you get a 20 to 25 percent savings, which is really good. I mean, again, that's money in your pocket. And you get additional discount if you have ABIP certification. Um, and uh, you can see here um, on uh, more information about um, some of the coverage that uh, they have. Uh, additionally, um, in addition to malpractice insurance, the Fedora Billing and Revenue Cycle Management Company, um, ASIP has negotiated a special rate of 3% for members. Um, and you can see the services there that it includes uh, co comprehensive revenue cycle management, reporting, credentialing, um, charge payment and posting, et cetera. Um, you can see that they're rather comprehensive in that, and they do a lot of pain management. So if you're struggling with revenue cycle management, uh, I really think you should consider looking into that because we all need to get paid for our services, and it's very difficult and cumbersome to follow up with insurance and all that. I mean, it, sometimes it can be quite frustrating too. So sometimes it's good to hand it off to experts. Um, 
There's another tip and pearl that I want to give you while I'm on the phone with you um, now here today. Um, I don't use Fedora, I, you know, for no other reason than, uh, you know, I have nothing against them or anything like that. I've just been doing billing a certain way for the past 12 years. Uh, but I opened a surgery center recently, and when I hired a billing company for that, one of the things I negotiated up front is that I would pay my uh, percentage payment back to them with a credit card every month. Uh, and the reason why I did that is um, I got a Capital One credit card. What's in your wallet, right? You get a 2% cash back rate when you do that. So if you pay early when you have one of those credit cards that gives you cash back, um, <clears throat> you know, you get that basically back, right? So if you are uh, charging at a 3% rate for your billing and you use one of those credit cards that gets you 2% back and you pay it early to get that 2% benefit, essentially you've paid 1% of your gross revenue for revenue cycle management. That's incredible, by the way. I mean, it's really something that you guys should think about doing if you haven't done it already. Um, I don't know if Fedora particularly does that. I, this just popped into my head while I was talking to you because this is what I do in my particular practice. But that's just money in your pocket, right? So it's another pearl that you get, obviously, being a member of ASIP to, uh, to deal with revenue cycle management as well. Um, also, we... Um, talk about normal practice recommendations. Um, this is something that Shawnee is going to be talking about soon. You can see the task force members there. Kartik was also on our task force as well and uh, very helpful uh, as we move forward and discuss how to return to practice. Uh, COVID brought the world to a standstill, but it didn't bring um, audits and investigations uh, to a standstill. Uh, we're still working on LCDs. We're still working on guidelines. Um, ASIP is still actively working on many things uh, for you guys and to advocate for you. Uh, one thing that I would hope that we could do is uh, consider you guys filling out this uh, COVID-19 pandemic burnout survey. Um, ASIP would like to assist our members in uh, you know, kind of evaluating the degree of disruption to our members' practices in the pandemic. Uh, if you could complete this survey, it would really help us as we uh, you know, not, not only um, learn and understand how we can better serve your needs, but uh, you know, there could be some, some things that um, could help us help you. Um, so please consider filling out that burnout survey. Uh, I will now turn the uh, call over to Dr. Shalini Shaw, who's going to talk to us about the return to practice um, and the risk mitigation stratification guidance that ASIP has come up with, including all the deliverables that ASIP has come up with to help you uh, as you return to practice. Shalini? Thank you, Amol. I wanted to thank um, Dr. Lachman Tikanti as well as ASIP for this incredible opportunity to serve our pain society and our pain members. You know, there is a lot of apprehension as we plan our, to open our doors again and go back to work. I don't know about you, but I actually have more apprehension about going back to work and how I'm gonna bring these patients back and protect my staff than, than when I went off of work. So ASIP was very forward thinking in this and realized that this is a, a, a pressing um, concern amongst the pain community and put together a task force. And this task force, which includes Dr. Subir Diwan, Dr. Soin, Dr. Chris Garibo, Dr. Karthik Rajput, has been working, I will say, tirelessly for the last three to four weeks, every single day getting on phone calls, reviewing at least 100 papers, manuscripts, postmortems, um, Wuhan reports, you name it, to find out what uh, are these patients presenting with, what leads them to go down the path of um, severe comorbidity and what patients do well and how do we bring our practices back? How do we mitigate that risk? So as you know, about 10 days ago, Trump announced we're going to open up America again. And just so you know that there is a gatekeeping process. So this is not a, a, a whirlwind, open up your, your, your state, open up your borders, open up your hospitals. But there is a gated process that needs to occur before we can open up. And as you know, there is a phase um, process. The most important portion to realize is that the hospitals have to have robust testing in place for at-risk healthcare workers, okay? And that includes antibody testing. So these processes need to be in place before we even consider opening our health centers, okay? Secondly, the healthcare system has to have a capacity, meaning they must be ample PPE, there must be ample uh, ICU and ventilator um, availability in the event that we have a secondary surge, okay? And how do hospitals and health systems know to open up? Well, it depends on the governor. It depends on your governor when he, do, he or she decides to open up your state. Um, that's how we will know that we are ready to open up our health system. The, one of the most important questions that is on everybody's mind, 
today is do we test? If we test, how do we test? What test do we use? When do we test? Who do we test? It's incredible. Uh, there are about 400 tests I just read about um, for COVID, but whether it's a PCR or serology, only four are currently FDA approved for serology testing. But one of the things that we know is that antibody tests could be the key to reopening this country. And whether you believe it's protective immunity or it grants you no immunity, one of the things that you cannot deny is that it's a drastic public health improvement measure. Because as many studies have shown from USC, Dr. Neeraj Suit's study and other studies from New York have shown that the actual percentage of patients with the prevalence of COVID is much higher than we actually know today. For example, in LA County, it's pro probably four to five times as much um, prevalence than what we actually have right now, what we, what we know to be true. So doing antibody testing will give us an opportunity to do tracer and public health documentation of how widespread this, this um, pandemic is. So that belongs, uh, brings us to the actual point of why we're discussing this today, is how do we return to work, okay? So one of the task force um, deliverables was, let's create a toolkit for the pain physicians. Let's create together a packet of resources that would help us decide who do we bring back, how do we open up, and in which order. And in order to do that, you have to understand how do we approach this problem, meaning what was our methodology, okay? One of the principal things that drove, uh, that was the driver of our methodology was, how do we decrease the risk to patients from devastating complications from COVID? We know that patients can get COVID anywhere. You can go to Costco, your grocery store, wherever it is, and you can get COVID. Whether or not COVID came from your office is irrelevant at this point. The, what, what we can do as physicians is make sure those patients who are at risk for COVID or at risk for high complications from COVID do not develop those complications, right? That's what our job is as physicians. So one of the things we talked about is that how do we risk stratify our patients? A lot of practices, a lot of operating rooms are talking about opening up their doors and opening up to elective surgeries. But one of the key factors that I personally feel is missing from the conversation is how do we risk stratify these patients, okay? How do we talk to the patients about consent? How do we inform them about the risk of COVID based on what we know? And this is these are all the deliverables that this task force has come up with and I'm gonna share with you today. One of the other questions that's really on our mind is do we inject steroid? Does that lead to significant immunocompromise? Can that reactivate the virus, right? There's a whole bunch of considerations for office st uh, staff safety as well. So let's go through this. This is our risk stratification guideline, okay? So I wanna be very clear. When we are talking about risk stratification, we are talking about decreasing the patient's risk of developing serious sequelae related to COVID. We are not talking about developing or contracting COVID itself, okay? So how do you predict, how do you prevent, or how do you risk stratify your patients such that they don't develop devastating complications? And this is the risk stratification algorithm that we came up with. You will notice that age and residence are independent risk factors, and this is from the CDC, meaning irrespective of everything else the patient has, if the patient is greater than 65 or resides in a nursing facility, that's an independent high risk factor, please do not proceed for procedure at this time. They're high risk for developing serious comorbidities. Pulmonary, if you have a patient with chronic lung condition that's moderate to severe asthma, that's included in this category, COPD, that's considered a high risk. Cardiovascular, we reviewed significant literature on cardiovascular um, complications and what are the risk factors. Um, we looked at post-mortem, uh, both from New Orleans as well as from New York City, and these are the recommendations that we found to be high risk. Hypertension plus CAD. Hypertension plus CHF. Hypertension, CAD plus CHF, or just CHF alone. I would, uh, independent risk factors also, and this is true from the JAMA article that was just recently published from New York City, it was published two days ago, as well as from New Orleans, obesity, diabetes, and, and um, pulmonary complications still have the highest risk factors. So obesity, BMI greater than 40, A1C greater than 8.5, uh, renal insufficiency on dialysis, cirrhosis are high risk factors for developing serious sequelae. 
Now, the biggest question is immunocompromised state. Okay, if a patient has any of the following, cancer, inactive treatment, um, or unstable immune deficiencies, or chronic steroid use, that promotes them to be in the high-risk category. And you can see our scoring sheet on the bottom. Essentially, at this phase, pre in preparation for phase one of opening, our recommendation as a committee is that if a patient has any high-risk category, is scored high risk on any of the above categories, we will delay the procedure. This is for phase one recommendations as we open up. We do not want a resurgence of COVID. We don't want to have complications. And these recommendations will be modified. It's a living fluid document, just like everything is fluid with COVID, uh, to be modified. But at this stage, as we consider opening up, these are the recommendations. Here is an easy to use flowchart. Okay, and the committee put this together with significant counseling of infectious disease experts amongst other experts to go over who do we test, do we test, do we not test, and these are our recommendations. As you have a patient present to your office, you either know their COVID status or you don't. So they'll tell you, yes, I've had COVID and I've recovered, or I've had COVID and I had positive antibodies. In those cases, we feel it's safe to proceed with the procedure. However, in those cases in which patients do not know their COVID status, whether they've been exposed or not, the next point on the flow chart is, are they symptomatic? If they have had any types of fever or cough or any pulmonary symptoms in the last 14 days to suggest COVID, please delay your procedure, refer them for COVID testing. If it's positive, quarantine your patient. What about for the majority of our patients? This is where the real bulk of, of um, thought has to be put in place. 80% of our patients will not know their COVID status, and 80% of those patients will be asymptomatic, okay? So for those patients who are asymptomatic for the last 14 days, this is where the risk stratification comes into place, where we scored on the patients. If they scored at low risk, moderate risk, or high risk, it depends. If they are low risk, you may consider safely proceeding just using the lowest therapeutic steroid dose. If your patient is in the high-risk category, you may want to delay, or you should highly consider delaying your procedure, sending them for COVID testing, which means either the PCR testing and or serology testing. Now, what about the moderate-risk candidate? And again, this is going to be the large bulk of our patients in this category. This is where we really leave it up to the individual physicians to make that risk-benefit analysis. You know your patients best. Um, and in terms of how severe the presenting pain symptoms are, you may proceed, just knowing that you have to use the lowest steroid dose possible. Now, if you feel that your patient's more in the high moderate risk category, it is okay to delay for further testing, further um, COVID testing. I wanna make a very important point here. When we talk about risk stratification and going through this flow chart, one of the important things to note is that you should try to have this risk stratification done about 24 to 48 hours prior to the procedure. Now, whether it's a nurse or your MA calling it to the patient and doing this risk stratification, it's very easy to do. It takes less than five minutes. Um, you'll, have a, you'll have less backlog and um, just move your clinic a little bit in terms of workflow a little bit faster to, so you're not on the day of procedure making these decisions. So our recommendation is that you do this a day to two prior to the um, scheduled procedure to risk stratify and then to do the flow chart to see what category they're in. And for those of you um, who work in a bigger health system, this is a great opportunity for your health, your nurse, your MA to say, doc, they scored moderate risk, what should we do? So you're not waiting to the last minute to make those decisions. Now, here is the other portion of what our deliverable was. There is a significant amount of questions that need to be answered about COVID and pain and how do we return to practice. One of the things the committee thought was very important to do is to talk about frequently asked questions and then answer them with the best amount of evidence that we have because this committee, like I said, has been working tirelessly and probably is one of the strongest um, committees on pain management and COVID. So the question is, what procedures am I able to do right now? And, you know, this is really due to your state-to-state -state variability, what your governor suggests you can do, what your health system allows you to do. Um, again, if you can risk stratify your patients to the low or to the moderate patients, um, you are pretty much open to do um, the regular procedures that you normally would have done. Just know that if you can avoid steroids, for example, trigger points, maybe you don't need steroids. 
MBBs, medial branch blocks, you perhaps can do without steroids. If you can do without steroids, particularly in the phase one, um, that, that would be advisable. Again, we talked about steroids. PPE, I would suggest universal masking for all of your patients. We've also, if possible, if, um, not only screen your staff for temperature when they walk into the office, but also screen your patients for temperature. Um, Gloves, glass, sterile, um, sterile gloves like we normally use. Um, nothing much has changed because we are doing non-aerosolized procedures. Now, if your patients are intubated or um, use um, anesthesia, that's a different story. You may want to talk to your healthcare institution or your state to see how you want to proceed on that. Uh, we talked about what precautions to take. Um, what if your staff member or yourself has possible symptoms of COVID? What should I do? You know, at this time, you would really recommend to talk to your healthcare provider. It's very reasonable to have your staff screened either with the PCR or even with serology antibody testing. I can tell you here where I work at, at UC Irvine, we are screening with serology uh, antibody testing for all of our healthcare workers that do OR or procedural-based specialties. Um, and that's not only true for the physicians, but also for our staff, our MA and nursing. It's very important to us that we take safety first as a precaution. Um, what else do I need to be doing in my office to prepare the waiting room? The waiting room is a big consideration. Keep social distancing six feet apart. I would recommend telehealth is still reimbursable at the in-person rate until June 6th, hopefully, if we keep our fingers crossed, maybe until August. Use telehealth to the maximum until you feel that it's safe to opening up more and you can bring your new patients in in a staggered approach. Consider new patients first and then follow-ups. One of the other questions that we received a lot from the physician community was, how do I talk to my patients about COVID? You know, patients have a reasonable right to ask, will this cause me to have COVID symptoms if I'm asymptomatic? Will this hurt my chances? I'm in a lot of pain, uh, but I still need to have this procedure. You know, significant amount of anxiety from the patients as well. Is it safe for me to come into the facility? So what we have done through the committee is draft a, a sample informed consent. And this will be available, all of these materials, by the way, is going to be available on the ASAP website and through social media and things like that. But use this, feel free to adopt it, put your practice name and logo on it, and you'll find as you read through it, it's pretty standard and straightforward. It follows the principles of reasonable informed consent, which includes risk benefits and alternatives based on the information that we know today. We are not over-exaggerating our pain therapies nor under-reporting the complications that can occur. We are very straightforward about what, what are the reasonable side effects to expect from COVID. So use this. You'll find this very, very useful. To, and if not, if your risk management doesn't allow it to go through, at least it's a conversation starter. It's a way for you to form your words to have that conversation before procedures with patients. These are just some of the selected references. I can tell you, it's, uh, like I said, it, We've uncovered just about every article that has been possibly written about COVID and symptomology and risk factors. Uh, just some selected references for your review in case you are interested in reading. It's a great read. Um, very interesting to read the postmortems. Um, and that's about it. Um, I will turn this over to Mr. Patel now uh, for him to talk about revenue cycle management. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shah. So what we're going to spend the next few minutes talking about today is revenue cycle management. Now, even under the most routine of circumstances, revenue cycle management has always been critical to the success of any independent private practice. However, what we've seen is that with the reduced patient volume that has been the resulting impact of COVID-19, it's become ever more critical to make sure that every single outstanding dollar that the practice has in claims is collected efficiently and as quickly as possible. The overall decline in reimbursement during this period has created an immense amount of pressure on private practices. And we're not just talking about care delivery, we're also talking about coding, we're talking about billing, we're talking about collections processes. And of course, while all of this is going on, year over year, insurance companies' requirements uh, are always becoming continually more stringent. As such, it is of the utmost importance that we have an effective revenue cycle management process in order to make sure your practice is collecting effectively for all of the services that it's delivering. Now, when we talk about revenue cycle management, there are going to be four critical processes that every single practice needs to be that every single practice needs to be extremely efficient with. And these four processes are eligibility and benefits verification, pre-certification/prior authorization, of course, billing, 
and AR in denial management. And I'll just take a minute, I'll just take a couple of minutes to walk you through each of these. Let's start off with eligibility and benefits verification. Now, when we talk about the eligibility and benefits verification process, what we want to do is make sure that our EV and BV teams are able to accurately identify the current eligibility status as well as the current benefits for all patients who are on the schedule on a daily basis. Now, how you go about doing this varies depending on your EHR, but what the most common, the most common approach that we typically take is that we have our EV and VB team take a look at the daily visit report and make sure that we've identified the current status and the benefits of all patients before they ever come into the practice. Of course, the goal here is to make sure that we're preventing any eligibility-related denials. You don't want to see any patient uh, who has expired insurance unless and until you get their updated insurance information so you have the right company to build for. Now, the second critical process is going to be the pre-certification authorization process. The goal of the pre-cert and authorization process is that, first of all, the practice needs to identify every single treatment and payer combination that actually requires a prior authorization. Secondly, we have to make sure that we initiate all prior authorizations in a timely fashion. And third and finally, uh, for those prior authorizations that are not being received in a timely fashion, we have to make sure that we follow up with the payer on those outstanding prior auths before the patient ever comes into the office. The last scenario that your practice ever wants to be under is one in which the, pa the patient is physically there and has to be told to go and come back again uh, simply because of the fact that a prior authorization hasn't been received. So, what, so exactly how is it that we go about doing this? So the first thing that we want to do is make sure that we've established and regularly updated all of the treatment and payer combinations that actually require a prior authorization. The second is going to be the timeline. What we want to do is make sure that every single, excuse me, what we want to do is make sure that we're initiating these prior authorization requests well enough in advance to actually get the prior authorization in. Uh, our standard practice with our company is that we must initiate all prior authorizations a minimum of seven days before the patient comes into the practice. However, the ideal scenario would be to uh, initiate the prior auth request at the same time that the patient is scheduled. And of course, maintaining records of the conversations with the payer in case you get an incorrect denial back. The third process is going to be the billing process. And what our goal with the billing process is, is to make sure that every single claim is as clean as it can possibly be before we actually go ahead and submit the claims. And how is it that the practice goes about doing this? The number one thing that the practice can do to make sure that all claims are clean is make sure that there's a thorough and rigorous scrubbing process after is to make sure that there's a rigorous and thorough scr claim scrubbing process that makes sure that there's a payable diagnosis that's attached to every single claim, that makes sure that we've appended the correct modifiers with all of our claims, making sure that we've reviewed to make sure that we're not over or under coding, making sure that we're submitting all charges on a daily basis, and in case you're in an ASC, making sure that, you, uh, that the office component and the ASC component of billing both are reconciled. And of course, we want to make sure that we do this in a timely fashion. So typically, uh, an ideal turnaround time for the claims to actually be submitted from the practice is anywhere between 24 to 48 hours, so one to two business days. And the fourth critical process is going to be denials and AR management. And the goal of the denials and AR management is to, go, is to make sure that whenever a denial actually does come through, that the team has identified the correct reason for the denial and initiated work on the appeal with a minimum turnaround time. Ideally, we would like to see that within receipt of a denial during the payment posting process, we've identified it, and within 24 to 48 hours, we've initiated the appeal, excuse me, we've initiated the appeal process. Now, of course, depending on what the reason for the denial was, it's not always feasible for the practice to actually complete the appeal and get it out within two business days. But within two days, you should ideally have identified the reason for the denial and started working on following up on it and making sure that we get it appealed. Of course, the critical point here is to make sure that the appeal gets submitted before that claim falls into the timely filing limit. Because once a claim goes into TFL, it becomes almost impossible to actually collect on. Now, how is it that we can go about making sure that these four that these four processes are actually working in the right way? And denials are going to be the practice's best tool when we talk about how we can identify uh, how efficient your revenue cycle is. So, what we would recommend is that you institute a weekly denial analysis at your practice that tracks the reasons for denials coming through. What this will allow you to do is spot exactly what reason, excuse me, uh, is allow you to identify exactly what reason the denial is coming from. 
So for example, if you're seeing a lot of eligibility related denials, then you know something's wrong with your eligibility process and it needs to be looked at. Same thing with prior authorization, same thing with denials. And what the weekly analysis will do is allow you to spot all of these issues before the impact actually results in a significant financial loss to the practice. Aside from the weekly denial process, we also recommend that you take a close look at your monthly KPIs, uh, your production to collection rates, uh, your days to bill, uh, your average days in AR, uh, your denial rate, and what, you, and what component of your AR is above 120 days. What all of these individual metrics will allow you to do is spot the overall financial health of your practice when it comes to how effectively you're collecting on your outstanding claims. Now let's talk a little bit more specifically about COVID-19. As a result of the challenges posed by COVID-19 to the, <clears throat> to the private practice landscape, Medicare has gone ahead and loosened a lot of the regulations around telehealth and also increased the reimbursement as a few speakers mentioned before. Uh, the service can be rendered by physicians, by PAs, by NPs. Uh, you can use any kind of technology to get to fulfill the audiovisual component. You can use Skype, you can use FaceTime, uh, WhatsApp, Google Hangouts, pretty much anything that allows you to have both the audio and the visual component. And of course, there's no there's going to be no two excuse me. And of course, there's going to be no two percent sequestration cuts for the remainder of 2020. And finally, the last critical aspect of Medicare's changes is that Medicare is going to pay reimbursement on the, play, on the point of service where the treatment would have been provided otherwise. In the past, telehealth was reimbursed at POS2, which resulted in 20% of, uh, which resulted in your reimbursement being deducted by 20%. Now, in terms of the actual coding, uh, we'll go into a little bit more detail later on as well, but uh, Medicare is currently covering both phone calls as well as audiovisual calls. For audiovisual calls for Medicare, you just build the standard visit code with the POS 11 and modifier 95. And for phone calls, I've also included the, uh, the individual coding details therein. Now, one of the biggest problems that uh, we've encountered when it comes to actually billing for telehealth is that while the POS 11 and 95 modifier with the regular E&M code is the correct code to take as per Medicare's standards and as per Medicare's guidelines. What we found is that a number of private companies and a number of the commercial plans uh, have not modified their edits to actually pay out based on that individual code and POS and modifier combination. So what we've done here is we've prepared, is we've prepared a brief summary of all of the plans that we've built for along with instructions on what POS to use and what modifier to use with your ENM codes to make sure that you guys actually get paid on these claims. One of the most important things to do right now is to make sure that your practice is staying up to date with all changes in billing procedures. Uh, as we've seen in the past month, uh, all of the various guidelines around telehealth billing have changed frequently on a payer by payer basis. Uh, so what's really important to do is make sure that the practice is updating the providers on all of the amendments and changes in the local carrier medical policy to make sure that you're actually billing in the correct way, to ensure that your practice is actually correct, is actually collecting the revenue that it's due. Of course, it's very important to make sure that you always maintain proper documentation for all of your procedures and your ENMs. The last scenario we ever want to be in is one in which Medicare comes back and audits the practice and uh, we end up being non-compliant because of incorrect, because of insufficient documentation. Especially when you're talking about sensitive procedures, uh, which are audit triggers for pain management practices, we want to make sure that uh, we want to make sure that we've documented everything in the correct way. Now let's talk about some of the common areas where we've seen our pain, the pain management practices that we've worked with actually tend to leak revenue. So one of the biggest causes tends to be underbilling for contrast and drugs. Another major cause of under, excuse me, another major cause of revenue leakage with pain practices is that we're not capturing waste billing in its entirety. We also want to make sure that we're capturing all of our supplies billing in its entirety. We want to make sure that every single visit and procedure that's in the practice is actually being billed for. We want to make sure that we're billing for the correct number of procedure levels. And finally, we want to make sure that we're correctly using both the 59 and the 25 modifiers. Now, uh, I'd like to take a couple of minutes to just walk you through a case study of one of the pain management practices that we've worked with in the past so you can get a sense of what kinds of denial reasons, what kind of revenue cycle management issues we saw at the practice, and how, about we, and how exactly we went about addressing those and make sure that the practice actually collected on what it was due. 
So this particular pain management practice, uh, we've been working with for about two years now. When we brought them on board, uh, one of their biggest issues was that they had a significant volume of timely filing limit denials, and they also were sending their bills out quite late. Uh, the practice was also receiving a number of denials because the diagnoses were uncovered for the particular treatments that they were billing for. What we also found was that there was an inconsistent in, there was inconsistency in terms of denial follow-up. So what happened is that there was a lot of money that was sitting out there in practice AR, nobody was actively working on. And finally, there were issues around the coding, which was resulting in billing-related denials. So what exactly did we do to address these issues? So the first thing that we did is we enforced an absolutely rigorous billing schedule. Uh, this was both on the provider side as well as on our side, where we made sure that uh, all the providers signed off their charges on a timely fashion. And on our end, we made sure that all of the claims were significant, excuse me, that all of the claims were successfully submitted within two business days of the date of service. So essentially within 48 hours, all claims were scrubbed and were sent out. We also instituted a very rigorous claim review process. And because we were seeing a lot of denials because of diagnoses, what we did is we focused particular attention on making sure that we were appending a payable diagnosis with every single claim. At the same time, we also provided a lot of guidance to the providers and uh, explained to them exactly what diagnoses were actually payable for particular procedures to make sure that we addressed that particular denial category. Uh, to address the issues with the stagnant AR, what we did is we instituted a mandatory 48-hour turnaround time for denial follow-up. So essentially, after receiving a denial, within 48 hours, our team had identified the reason for the denial and started working on uh, and started working on the appeal to make sure that those claims that were once stagnant were now starting to get paid. And of course, the priority was to work backwards from the timely filing limit. So if you're ever in this situation, you want to start with your older claims that are approaching TFL first to make sure they don't fall into the TFL category. Because once it does, like I said before, it becomes very, very difficult to actually collect. And finally, there were a number of coding issues, especially around uh, urine analysis, uh, around their injections, and around J3301, which we also did. And the results of these processes were quite significant for the practice. Uh, so in terms of their overall days in AR, uh, for the first five months that we worked with them, we saw their days in AR fall by over 61%. We also saw that their denial rate fell by 41% during that same time period. 63% uh, of the AR that we had, excuse me, 63% of their old AR was also resolved during the same period of time. And finally, just talking about pure revenue numbers, uh, insurance revenue increased 32% uh, in those first five months, uh, and patient re and, excuse me, and patient revenue also increased by 15%. This is just a very high-level summary of uh, one of the case studies of one of our previous practices. Hopefully, uh, there's some knowledge there that your practice can also gain from it. With that, I'd like to pass the mic back to Dr. Manchikanti. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Maharshi, and thank you, Shalini. Wonderful, great presentations. We already have multiple questions, uh, but we will hold them until the next speaker finishes. Next speaker is Ian. Uh, he is uh, president, uh, chairman, CEO of uh, Anesthesia Dynamics, and uh, he also has a lot of other interests. Uh, he's very well known in farming IPAs. We have been trying to farm an IPA for a long, long time, but we never succeeded in it. Today, I want to see if he can provide us uh, with a pathway for formation of an IPA and how it will help our membership. Here is Ian. Ian? Hello, everyone. Thank you. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, hi everyone. Thank you for having me today. Um, I appreciate your time and your attention. So the topic is IPA, um, Independent Physician Association. Um, and you know, is this a, a reactionary or revolutionary um, uh, step in, in the healthcare industry. Um, over the last, um, let's say, uh, three, four, even five years, um, we've seen a tremendous amount of consolidation within the healthcare industry. If we take it back a little bit further to even 10 years or 15 years, this started with the uh, consolidation in the insurance realm of various smaller healthcare insurance providers 
uh, being gobbled up by some of the larger uh, healthcare insurances. And you know this uh, proceeded from you know 15 to 10, um, and even up to current. Um, but what we've seen also in, in this this um, cons consolidation of, of the healthcare industry, we've seen the insurances now taking a bold step into um, the acquiring of, of various verticals outside of the insurance industry. Um, some examples of this would be uh, the um, um, acquisition of um, uh, surgical care affiliates by United Healthcare, um, also known as, as Optum. Um, we saw this with Aetna um, acquiring CVS pharmacies. Uh, we've seen this with United Healthcare acquiring um, uh, Davida Medical Group. Um, so we're seeing the insurance companies start to venture into more and more control of the various verticals within the healthcare industry. And we've also seen this amongst the suppliers within the healthcare industry, whether this be equipment, disposables, uh, drugs. Um, but we are seeing a, a continuing trend where the healthcare insurances are taking greater and greater control of um, the various verticals within the healthcare industry. We've also seen this amongst the hospitals, and, and that has happened for a longer period of time where the hospitals have slowly uh, acquired or employed more and more of the verticals within the healthcare industry. So what we have seen in, in response to this, or potentially uh, as a resolution to this, is the um, uh, consolidation of uh, physicians um, to try to uh, establish a, a, a purchasing power. And you know, this has formed into what we call the Independent Physician Association. Um, and it has served in, in various uh, capacities as far as the interests of the physicians that belong to the association. Um, this may be working with um, regulatory parties, whether at the state level, level or the federal level. Um, this may be to uh, reduce administrative burdens. Uh, this may be to um, uh, you know, try to find new products and, and bring them to practices in a, a faster, more efficient manner. Um, but largely we've seen this on the pair contract negotiations where bringing together several physicians in, in a variety of different markets or even in a single market to try to give some negotiation leverage or, or power to the physicians to counter this consolidation that we've seen in the market. In, are you moving your slides? Or, okay, good. Thank you. Yeah. So, sorry about that. Well, so, um, so looking at some of the, the various areas that a, an IPA can um, serve a, a physician's practice, um, and, and we see a lot of this in what we call professional employment organizations, uh, this consolidation as well, where HR management, various tasks where a physician practice may have to hire um, an HR manager to handle the staff uh, of their practice and address all the issues that come along with that from compliance to training to payroll. Um, there are services and companies that, that provide this service um, and at a rate that you know maybe you know, 20 or 30% of what um, the cost would be to an individual physician practice. Um, insurance coverage, this is a large area that we've seen a large benefit in, in independent physician associations where collectively getting together and bringing a lot of lives together, we can get the premium price from various healthcare insurance companies down uh, tremendously. We've seen savings on this level of 30 to 40 to even 50 percent, depending on how large uh, the, the IPA is when we bring all of the employees across all of the different physician practices together. And this may be medical, vision, dental, disability, life. There's a variety of different areas here that um, as a single force you can negotiate um, tremendous discounts. Also, we see this in the benefit management area as far as um, 401k um, administrators. You know, typically, if uh, an individual were to um, uh, work with a a large benefit management fund. Uh, they may see rates in the area of 2% uh, of the 
portfolio that you have that they're charged um, for managing their portfolio. Um, with a with an IPA, you may have the leveraging power to bring that down tremendously to a, um, a half a, a percentage point or even a quarter percentage point um, in trying to determine you know what is the uh, the best for the overall physician organization. We also see this in, in group purchasing discounts with various suppliers um, and pharmaceutical companies, um, trying to negotiate a fee schedule that is very focused to the, the practices within the IPA as far as the, the specific drugs, disposables, and equipment that are used within those practices that um, you know, bulk um, discounts can be achieved um, through um, consolidation um, of interest. But typically, we see the main area of benefit and the, and the most interest is surrounding managed care contracting. Um, and there's a variety of different um, aspects here. And I'm sure all of you have, have had to negotiate with uh, healthcare insurance, and it's it's not a very fun activity, and it can be extremely frustrating. And you just don't have a lot of power um, at the table many times because there's um, so much consolidation in the industry now that the insurance company has a lot of different options. Um, and the more options they have, uh, the less leverage you have. But some areas to look at if you're engaging in IPA that may be helpful in negotiation is the network access. A lot of times uh, an insurance company won't let you into their network because they say it may be uh, saturated. Um, and, you know, one of the ways to, to use an IPA is to guarantee access for the members into that insurer uh, and into that insurer's market. And also to streamline or expedite the entrance into that market as far as lowering the credentialing thresholds or um, expediting the credentialing process. Another area we see is as far as fee schedules. Um, really working hard to focus onto those uh, procedures that um, are most commonly done within the IPA and working and focusing to um, raise those rates uh, to an area that would be very beneficial to the practice. We also see an area of, of negotiation here as far as coverage policies, uh, trying to redesign um, you know, the, the policies to meet maybe federal levels versus uh, state levels or um, trying to um, influence um, the bundling of uh, uh, different types of care. Um, we've seen a lot in, in these um, package pricing for different types of uh, diagnoses. And then also in reimbursement policy, um, as I referred to earlier, as far as bund bundling procedures together, um, restricting the number of procedures that can be done within a certain period of time, reducing um, the fee schedule as far as um, from uh, multiple procedures being done in one day, um, and um, also with respect to the places of service that these procedures are being performed. So a lot of different areas that, um, you know, an IPA could serve to negotiate not only the, the rate that's being paid, but the access to the networks, uh, the coverage policies, as well as within those coverage policies, um, the, um, the different type of grouping of procedures. So, in the industry, we've seen two primary groups of IPAs. One is a messenger IPA, and that is where the IPA reaches out to the various um, areas of interest and tries to negotiate contracts and is essentially working on behalf of the IPA um, and handles uh, you know, these negotiations and works almost like a subscription fee or a, um, a per provider or per employee fee. Uh, where in order to participate in the IPA, you pay the subscription fee maybe annually or monthly um, or on a per physician uh, rate. Um, but essentially, you're, you're purchasing that subscription to get access uh, to these different um, um, opportunities that exist with the IPA. So you're paying in, in, in the front end for access uh, to, that, to those opportunities. Um, you know, so this is nice in the sense that the IPA takes care of um, all the various enrollments with the insurances for you, um, handles the negotiations, um, but gives you some freedom as far as your 
ability to opt in and opt out of the programs um, and engage the insurers uh, and the suppliers directly. And finally, we've got um, what we call a forward-facing IPA. And this is where the IPA acts essentially like a, a one company under a single tax ID um, where all of the agreements um, are engaged with the IPA under one single tax ID and then the members access uh, those various opportunities through the IPA. Um, so this is nice in the sense that um, you don't have to pay an upfront fee or a subscription fee. Um, the uh, discounts are usually worked um, through the IPA and um, adjusted on your price. So we see a lot of um, a lot of growth in the last five to ten years in the um, messenger IPA, um, but more recently in the forward facing IPA, um, just to essentially consolidate the um, negotiations and give more power in the contract into the IPA. I just want to close with you know. You know, the, the opportunity for us all is just to try to make a bigger pie. Um, how do we raise our revenue? And there's some key points here as far as you can expand your service um, by doing more patients, expanding your geographic area. Uh, but one of the areas that, that the IPA can serve is just to try to increase contractual allowances. Um, as far as quality of care, uh, that's something that we all strive for every day. And collection rate, that you know, it's engaging a good RCM process and a good RCM provider. Um, and with that, I close. I know I'm over time. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ian. Uh, now we have a famous speaker here. We are so grateful that he's willing. He came here to talk to us and tolerated the cancellation yesterday. Randy Alvarez, he's the founder and CEO of the Wellness Hour. He's a TV personality, business strategist, author and podcast producer, but also an accomplished speaker. Wellness Hour airs on TV approximately to 70 million homes across the United States and Canada, featuring some of the nation's leading medical doctors and other licensed healthcare practitioners. I came across uh, watching his show a few years ago, which he made for a dentist in Paducah. Then I forgot all about it. And again, I watched again. Then I contacted him and he made several infomercials for me. And he's a great guy. Here is Randy Alvarez. Dr. Mancicanti, thank you for inviting me here today. So in the next 20 minutes, I'm going to give some advice on what you can do in the short term and in the long term to kind of attract more patients. You know, look, most of you are already very busy, but many of you aren't as busy doing the procedures that you want. And so we're talking about those things today. My first slide says advertising and marketing seekers are the most successful practices. You know, marketing secrets is a big cliche, it's overused. But what I have found uh, when I infiltrate and go inside some of the most successful practices, financially speaking, they don't want everybody else to know what they're doing. So I'm gonna share with you some of those things. So for more than 20 years, I have uh, been working with and helping market and advertise, with marketing and advertising and business development with the high, some of the highest earning pain management practices. And so I'm going to share with you some of the things that I've, I've learned. Now, with the wellness hour, it looks like my slides are uh, uh, turning on their own. But so a couple things I do, just so you guys know what I do. We do video production, all types of video production, social media videos, uh, videos uh, that are public relation videos, videos that go on your website, and 30-minute long-form uh, advertising. And also we do advertising, uh, Google AdWords, or Google ads, Instagram ads, direct mail pieces, uh, print publications, things like that. And you look, in light of the coronavirus, a lot has changed. Uh, now, I, I got to give you a little bit about my start to give you some reference. Now, I don't know if you've ever watched the YouTube video or you watch an audio and they play it at 1.5 speed. Because of our the short time we have together, I'm going to speak a little faster than I normally do, if you don't mind. 
and kind of give you a little bio so you know a frame of reference where I'm coming from. So I wrote this book, The Art of Human Influence, uh, 25 years ago, and I was going around lecturing to anybody that would hire me to talk about influence pr principles, about how to design a presentation that was impossible to refuse. And one day a medical doctor, an internist, attended my lecture. And he said, do you think you could market my practice? And he was a weight loss doctor, and Fen Fen crashed his practice, and he was going to go back to Kaiser. And I said, well, I might be able to help you because I've been on a diet my whole life, and I've been reading a lot of books on, on, on nutrition and weight loss and things like that, trying to figure it out for myself. Make a long story short, we went into business together, and we were doing biochemical hormones and weight loss. Uh, it was women's health. And one day... The cable company came to us. We were doing well, all cash pay business 20 years ago. And this was somewhat of a controversial topic, marketing and uh, bioidentical hormones without growth hormone, just conservative therapies. And the cable company said, hey, why don't you guys do a half hour infomercial? We see your ads in the paper. And I said, no way, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna cheapen the doctor with some cheesy infomercial. And she goes, well, guess how much a half hour on TV is? And this was in Palm Springs, Palm Desert, California. And I said, I don't know, and I don't care. Well, guess how much? A half an hour of TV. Guess how much it is? Channel 7, 8 o'clock at night. I go, I don't know. She goes, it's $150. I go, what? Full half hour for $150? Now, all of you, wherever you are, wherever you're listening, I could buy primetime morning right next to the Today Show for $200. So that's how I got my start. And I told, so I told this doctor, I go, I think we hit the lottery. So we created this television format. So there's an expression, never get caught selling. So we bought this 30-minute block, 7 p.m. of airtime, talking about women's health, bioidentical hormones. We aired that show. It exploded. I mean, we could physically only do 100 new patients a month. The second guy that I got, actually the third guy that I got, was Roland Reinhardt. A young, at the time, a young, probably 40-year-old uh, pain management physician that was uh, an anesthesiologist, and he was working at Eisenhower Memorial Hospital in Palm Desert, California, and he lost his contract, lost his job. He had no referrals, nothing. It was very political out there. The desert, as he was saying, is a very small town. By referral, he contacts me and says, "What do you, th you know, do you think you could help me?" So, make a long story short. I found out what he was doing, and we did a 30-minute program on television talking about, and at that time, you know, he was doing injections, but he was doing implantable devices 20 years ago, and some spinal cord stimulation. Uh, I, I think it was uh, spinal cord stimulation 20 years ago, and we went on TV with it. In fact, it was the world's most boring show, but if you had back pain, neck pain, and you were in pain, you were at the edge of your seat because people didn't know this specialty even existed 20 years ago. Uh, now today, you have, it, you know, fast forward to today, and by the way, that guy, Roland Reinhardt, so 20 years ago, he started airing. He was spending about $300 a week to buy two primetime TV shows a week. Uh, he went to his second employee, fourth employee, then got 45 employees, owned the market, still owns the market for pain management over the hospital and over everybody else with this 30-minute long-form advertising. Now today, I, I'm not here to really just talk about 30 minute long form, but it's very powerful. In fact, you don't need to use me. You can actually get some patients in there and you can, uh, in your reception area, get an SLR camera, give the world's most boring lecture on spinal cord stimulation, regenerative medicine, uh, some of the things you're doing with uh, injection therapy, et cetera. If you were to air that on TV for 200 bucks, chances are you would get 30 new patients a month. Now, so, the thing is, look, most of you in the old days didn't have to advertise, and now you do. I'm going to give you a little bit of the things. Right now, we have, this print is small, but we hit about 90 million homes each week. We have about 1.2 million viewers every month, and it's growing. You know, they say it's not the big companies who eat the small. It's the fast companies that eat the slow. Look, virtual telemedicine is now the gold standard. It's the new best practices. Everybody's doing it. You got to hop on board with this. And there's techniques on how to do it better than ever. So you got to be fast to do some of these things. You know, what did Darwin say? Here we're in a recession. We're in a pandemic. Darwin said you know, the number one characteristic of these, pe of, of these species that would survive was their ability to adapt to change, to change your approach. Look, 
20 years ago, it might have been somewhat silly to advertise your pain practice. But guess what happened? Referrals started are starting to go away because the, G, the GP is becoming a so-called super specialist. There's plastic surgeons, dermatologists that are injecting stem cells or so-called stem cells into people. Uh, it, it's, it's, there's these mills. I don't have to tell you guys this, but there's these uh, injection mills where you have nurse practitioners, physicians, assistants. So the competition is changing and there's a sea change underway. You know, we all know the story about those fishermen. They go out and they don't even know about the rough seas they had. It capsizes them. So there is a sea change and you got to be ready to go because today the modern, the progressive interventional pain management doc is dealing with uh, Google. And, you know, there's a new doctor in town and this new doctor is confusing everybody. It's Dr. Google. You know, people come in thinking they know more about the procedures than you do. You got social media, online reviews and pain management ads all over the place. So what do you do? You know, and you may have to change your business model. You know, look, look at the taxi business. They're gone. They're almost gone because of Uber. They waited too long, waited too, they were too slow to adopt technology. Toys R Us, out of business. They could have done online sales. Sears, they're gone. They could have done online. Uh, you know, Apple and Steve Jobs, very successful, one of the biggest companies in the world, the most uh, arguably the most successful company in the world. And Steve Jobs, when he left the company for a little while and came back, he said, look, I got to think differently if I'm going to uh, make this happen. So here are some of the things that I'm encouraging all of you to do. And isn't it funny that the guy that's the head of the society, the chairman, Dr. Manchikanti, he, uh, he was doing this before I met him. He has emotionally charged, persuasive videos on his website. Everybody listening, look, you've been hanging out with yourself so long, you may take for granted. People don't know what, what uh, a spinal cord stimulator is. People don't know what a pain pump is. People don't know what regenerative medicine is at all. See, here's the challenge all of you are facing. And that is that, look, from my understanding, especially here in California where I'm talking to you, if you're in pain, your primary care physician under-medicates you, does everything they can to keep you away from getting or keeping you from getting addicted. Then when it gets so bad, then they end up with the spine surgeon or the orthopedic surgeon or somebody else. And what ends up happening is you're left out. They don't even go to you because they don't know you exist. So I'm saying the marketing that we're doing today has to be more geared toward creating a need where one didn't exist before, where they put you in the equation. I'm going to have to talk a lot faster if I'm going to cover some of this stuff. So look, we're all telling stories. We're telling stories to each other. We're telling stories to our patients, to our coworkers. Those doctors, those interventional pain docs that are, that are telling the most compelling stories like Dr. Manchikanti, they're going to be the busiest. Isn't it funny that it's not funny, but coincidentally, that the most successful pain people in Kentucky is led by Dr. Manchikanti because he's telling better stories. He's telling better stories on television. He's telling, telling better stories with his videos that he has, has on his website. These are all things that I can help you with. So you need to have, here's your marketing checklist. You need, mark, you need videos on your website, YouTube, email drip marketing campaigns. What's a drip marketing campaign? You're sending them information about these implantable devices. You're sending them information about regenerative medicine, et cetera. So why is advertising during a recession good? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fast forward to give you some specific ad samples of Google ads that you can do right now inexpensively. So first of all, why advertising in a recession? Look at all these companies, Coca-Cola, Chevrolet, Budweiser. What do these all have in common? That they all expanded their sales and profits and market share in a recession. See, here's the thing. Amateur marketers don't market in a recession. It's one of the first things they cut out. So your ads, your Google ads are going to stand out. They're going to become amplified. And look, old people, 40, 50, 60, 70 plus, people that weren't really computer savvy today are now doing Zoom meetings. They're online. So you having professionally produced or even not professionally produced videos on your website that help explain procedures and help explain why you'd want to see an interventional pain management physician are more important today than ever. Look, who loses if they go to someone else? You lose and the patient oftentimes loses. So look, in a recession, we know the first dollars companies usually cut are 
are uh, always in advertising. But look, history tells us that recessions are always followed by expansion and prosperity. I'm one of these crazy people. Look, I'm watching the same news as you are, whether it's CNN or Fox. I'm hearing what's going on, but I'm also crazy enough to think that things are going to get good again. They're going to be different. There's going to be a new normal. There's going to be new best practices. But we have always followed with a 256 growth. And look, if you're doing videos on your web, if you're doing videos on TV, guess what's going to happen? Mary Kay of Mary Kay Cosmetics said it best. She said people are more likely to do business with someone they know or with someone they don't know. And guess what? 99.99% of the population, they've never met an interventional pain management physician. So guess what? When you put a simple video on your website, they've never heard a pain management guy talk before. And if you could talk with a smile on your face and, <laughs> and chuckle a little bit, you know, one of the things Manchik, Dr. Manchikanti has is he, he's got this funny little laugh that goes with him. When I first saw Dr. Oz speak 20 years ago at the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine, I knew this guy was the one to watch. Look, as a media coach for network television, for PBS specials, I have had a hypersensitivity toward those guys that get it. So if you can talk and smile, great. Do you want to know something else? And I've got to mention this. Each one of you listening to this call, if you're a medical doctor, a DO, or whatever, you should be able, or a physiatrist, whatever, you're able to get on television. Call the news director yourself and say, look, make it sensational. You say, look, there are tens of thousands of people within this county that are in pain that don't have to be, or they're on older medications and they don't even know about their newer, longer acting medications. There are people on opioids that are candidates for some spinal cord stimulation. I don't know if that's true or not, but that are candidates for spinal cord stimulation to get them off and off meds and, and, and eliminate their constipation, give them mental clarity, make them feel good again, make them want to start a business again. So advertising in a recession is because your competition won't do it. Now, I'm going to fast forward here to some of the Google ads. One of the, look, if somebody searches, uh, you know, back pain, neck pain, boom, this pops up. Find a pain doctor near you. Here's another one. Virtual appointments available, top rated pain management, pain physicians, a new Albany, no, no office visits, in pain, call today, top rated pain management, make a phone appointment today, top rated pain management. These are just, these are just simple ads. By the way, you could be at the top of Google for as low as 10 bucks a day. You won't be there all day long, but you're going to be at the top of Google. You can Look, there's a couple ways to do it. You can either try to fool the search engines into finding you, or you just pay Google to be at the top. Um, so there's so many things. If you're looking through these things, virtual pain consultation, on and on and on, get reliable, fast updates. These are for the uh, ASIP website. Here's another one, a Facebook ad. There's a handsome group, the Pain Management Centers of America, make pain care available to thousands of patients. These are inexpensive ways you can do it. And in, and in summary here, look, when times are good, you should advertise. When times are bad, you must advertise. Finally, long form 30 minute advertising, and I got about one minute and a half left. I'm here to tell you, look, I have about five doctors that get on a plane every week and they fly out to see me in my San Diego location. And even the coronavirus has changed that. Now we can do Skype interviews that make you look like you're on network news. I've produced more than 3,200 of these that are airing on TV. I've produced more than 9,000 videos. I've been working with medical doctors for many years. And I remember, I help you with your messaging. I had Dr. Roland Reinhardt 20 years ago, and he said, Randy, the key to this thing is we get him back to function. I go, what the heck does that mean? I had to, I had to help him with his messaging. So I said, uh, so what do you mean it gets them back to function? He said, look, Randy, it's the difference between getting a good night's sleep and not. It's the, you know, when you don't sleep because of your back pain, you get up, you're not in a good mood. You get up, you're edgy with your spouse. You get up, you don't feel like starting a new business. When you get a good night's sleep, you wake up, you want to take on the world, okay? It's, and when you're out of pain, look, I've been personally, I've had sciatica for about a year. I wasn't in the mood to listen to what my wife had to say. I wasn't in the mood to start a business or listen to or watch a Netflix thing. Being in pain is, is, is a terrible thing. And so this 30-minute long form, this picture is a television show that it allows the public to know their options. It allows the public to know that you can actually, it's covered by insurance, by Medicaid, Medicare, by most insurances. You actually can ask your doctor, I'd like to see an interventional pain management physician. This is the future. It's happening right now. This is just 
Look, I know that TV's going away, but guess what? The 55 plus crowd, the paying crowd, they're still watching cable television. You can buy network or you can buy local television for just 200 bucks. And uh, let's work together. Here's my office number. See this text? I want you to focus on that text. 760-5350. Text me. If you say, look, because I have a team of salespeople, if you'd like to bypass them and talk to me directly, just send me a text and say, let's work together. I'll have one of my assistants set up a five-minute phone call. Um, and, you know, finally, I'd like to say those are the two email addresses for TV interviews, Anna Marie at Wellness Hour. If you want to – look, we're an advertising agency. Advertising an ad man is a psychiatrist, is a psychologist that – it's not just advertising because, look, it's not rocket science, but there's a science to moving humans to take action. And so, look, I'm a guy since 1983 that has been reading at least two books a month. I, I, I live it. I eat it. I breathe it. So we have affordable programs where I can manage your advertising for about $599 a month. So at any rate, Dr. Manchikanti, uh, boy, time went by fast for me, but I want to thank you for having me on the program and hopefully I can work together with many of you. Thank you very much. I'll hand it over to Kevin or Dr. Manchikanti. Uh, Dr. Manchikanti, thank you. Thank you, Randy. Now we open for questions. Uh, there is a question for uh, Dr. Devi and uh, Shalini. They already know this question, but uh, generally public wants to know. This is a release from New York Health Department. It This tweet came and there are 1,684 retweets and 2,721 likes. What this says is serological tests should not be used to diagnose acute or prior SARS-CoV-2 infection, nor should they be used to determine immune status to SARCOV2, they may produce false negative or false positive results, the consequence of which include provide, providing patients incorrect guidance on preventive interventions like physical distancing or protective, protective equipment. Now, we have been talking about this, and Governor Cuomo said they are going to do all healthcare professionals, test them with antibodies. We are all recommending, so when I saw this tweet, we wanted to do our employees, we wanted to test them. They started questioning, what are you going to do with negativities? So then they say that they may want to go home just because it tested positive. How do you know that you are still not, still not negative and you don't have any transmission capacity? Okay, thank you. Should um should we add anything also or? Yeah, yeah, go, go. That oh, is you. No. I was just going to say I, to you. Uh, sure. So I was going to say I mean, I think a couple of the issues are they say that they have a 93 to 100% sense uh sorry, sorry, specificity for some of the tests, but in terms of the sensitivity, we're not sure. So like Dr. Manchikanti was saying, the accuracy is not clear. And then on top of that, I mean, just as a practical concern, I'll say, for me, I'm not able to order a lot of these tests. So I think that it would be difficult to have it and then be able to test the employees or test the patients on a large scale basis. And will they be covered by insurance? I mean, generally, uh, you know, the Trump administration has said that these tests should be should be covered, the patients shouldn't have to pay, but we don't know for sure if we're ordering the test, what code would it be? What if it's FDA approved for emergency use or if it's not? So I think there's just a lot of confusion about how the tests could be used and whether you can even get them in New York. Shalini? Yeah, you know, I saw that tweet and it was interesting because I saw Cuomo last night on CNN saying the exact opposite, how he wants to just do antibody testing throughout its state. <laughs> Um, you, yeah, you saw that too. So it's interesting that we're getting mixed messages. I was reading more carefully into that notice from the NYC Public Health Department, and it said basically that antibody testing cannot be used to confirm acute immunity or acute infection, which makes sense. That we know. But I don't know how they're uh, making 
this statement that they don't want to do antibody testing anymore. They don't recommend it. So I'm interested to learn more about it. But I agree with Debbie, Dr. Debbie, same thing. Like, what are you going to do? Bill insurance? Can you balance bill patients? You know, I, I don't know. So what do we do as a consumer? So we have ordered the tests. Uh, if you guys remember, initially I said we will go ahead and do the test on every patient, every em all our employees, and then uh, Nilesh Patel said, what about false negatives, false positives? So we said we will do it twice. Then I figured out that how stupid that was, uh, that idea was because tests are not available. Now, only thing available once in a while is antibodies, and we, can we can't rely on it because we are going to get more questions than answers by doing this. Meanwhile, like in Arkansas, they don't even understand the severity of this issue and they don't even have enough testing. They're saying that every patient should be negative before they do any type of elective procedures. So any comment on that going forward? Now your risk stratification says that risk group three, they have to uh, undergo testing, right? Right. So the high-risk patients will undergo COVID screening testing to see if they have the infection. Um, antibody testing is a consideration, but we didn't put that as final recommendation because we don't know that much about testing or antibody testing to this date as of today. Um, so we will be revising the documents and recommendations with, once we learn more and more as, as the days go by. But what we do know is that antibody testing is a great, like we talked about, public health tool because it allows you to do the tracing to find out what is exactly the point prevalence of, of the virus in your county or in your community. Um, for example, New York Times just reported that one in five New York City residents are um, anticipated to be infected with COVID, which is much more than what we currently have on file. So I think as a, it's going to be a good public health tool as well as to do serology testing. The, your next question is, according with your, to your with your stratification, 65% of the pain patients are at high risk, don't you think? I guess I agree with that, but maybe not. <laughs> what do you think, Shalini or yeah. Devi? Yeah. yeah, this is a very fair question, and we debated this as, as, as a committee. And the reason we made these recommendations, and whoever asked, I think it's a great question, uh, because we are talking about phase one. We are talking about opening up, which we anticipate to be doing in a week or two. And so these recommendations are for the first phase of opening. And what we know is that anyone greater than age 65 is severely high risk for developing complications from, um, from COVID. And that's from the CDC directly. So we had to put that in there. Uh, we realize that most of our patients are over the age of 65, uh, but these guidelines will be released, I'm sorry, will be relaxed um, as we continue to open up and, and things look better. Uh, I was just gonna add, oh, I think from a malpractice point of view also, it's helpful to have guidelines like these even if the majority of our patients might be higher risk, at least if we start with, you know, with a graded approach, I mean, we're all at risk, like for patients having lawsuits after this, especially because so many of them have had a loss of income also and may have this untreated pain and, and become, you know, getting more frustrated and everything else. But I think at least, um, like Shalini said, if we do things in a systematic way and show that we're trying to uh, do the best we can for the patients, that, that will also help from that perspective. One qu Another question is, we keep, hear, keep hearing about hypertension. Does that mean controlled or uncontrolled? Yeah, we debated this again in the committee extensively. We really tried to answer that question because does uncontrolled hypertension or any risk factor, to be quite honest, does that make a difference versus controlled? And we couldn't find any literature to support uncontrolled or controlled hypertension um, was an independent risk factor. There may also be an issue with the, uh, with the ACE inhibitors and the ARBs. There's some evidence that maybe people are at greater risk of being on those. So if somebody has controlled hypertension and they're on one of those medications, uh, you know, that we don't, it's not, a, there's not enough evidence for people to stop it, uh, but it might increase their risk of having a problem with the coronavirus. 
What about loop diuretics? Diuretics. Well, we couldn't. Yeah, we couldn't find any evidence to suggest either way uh, the presence of loop diuretics to be a risk factor. Okay, then we will move on to another subject, and then we'll come back if you need to. But this question is: some hypercoagulability mechanisms are being theorized in pathogenesis of COVID morbidity. Hence, should hypercoagulable comorbidities be included as part of high risk in the risk stratification guidelines? That's an excellent question. And from what we have read is that hypercoagulable states in and of itself are not risk factor. But what it is, is it's a prognostic factor for worse outcomes for those patients who are admitted to ICU because of COVID. Does that make sense? So if you have been admitted already to the unit or are in critical condition from COVID, those patients with increased D-dimers or hypercoagulable states have poorer outcomes than those who did not. So it's more of a prognostic indicator rather than a predictive indicator. Okay, so next question is, what is the criteria to use modifier POS 11 versus POS 02 my practice is in Maryland, and we are being reimbursed by Medicare and all commercial insurers by using POS or 2 only. Yeah, Dr. Torres. Uh, yeah, Dr. Torres, I'd be happy to talk about this. Uh, so Medicare's guidance is that if you build POS 11 with the 95 modifier, you should be getting paid 100% of your standard E&M service. Now, uh, with that said, the problem and the challenge that we've been facing uh, specifically to COVID is that once this guidance was actually passed through, not all of the insurance companies actually updated their claim edits, and some still have claim edits where telehealth visits with a modifier 95 will get automatically rejected with a POS 11 because a POS 11 isn't supposed to be used for telehealth traditionally. Uh, if you recall back to my slides, I had one particular slide dedicated to uh, exactly which payer and state combination we're familiar with that we're billing with right now, and exactly what POS combination to use with them. Uh, actually, Dr. Torres, uh, I saw in your note that you're based out of Maryland. So what I can do is I've included my email address in the presentation. I'll have my team take a look at what our Maryland practices are currently doing, because right now, unfortunately, because of COVID, the situation is very fluid. And uh, I can get that way I can get you the most latest and greatest information about what you can bill and whether you can also bill with POS 11 and modifier 95. Okay, next question is, we do bill for medication, but not for contrast. Do insurance pay for contrast? Do insurance pay for medications for procedures done in ASC? Please don't read the names out. So. No problem. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, so the question, there are two questions. The first one is around uh, whether insurance companies are paying for medication for procedures being done in an ASC. And the second was uh, whether insurance companies are paying for contrast. So when we're talking about paying for contrast, uh, the answer is that it's going to depend on the individual insurance company and the individual plan. Uh, the overall trend is moving towards bundled payments, so the majority of payers will not be paying you separately for contrast, will be included in the bundle payment. But there are some payers for whom uh, they still do reimburse separately for contrast. So for those payers in particular, it would increase your reimbursement if you bill for contrast. Uh, the second question was around, uh, does the insurance pay for medications for procedures that are done in an ASC? Now, when we're talking about reimbursement for uh, drugs related to an ASC, uh, ASC payments are considered to be packaged payments, which means that all related services to that particular procedure are bundled together and paid in a lump sum. But for drugs, uh, there is one particular criteria which can allow you to actually get reimbursed on those drugs, and that's going to be dependent on whether that drug is on pass-through status. If the drug is not on pass-through status, then it's going to be included as a part of your bundle, and you won't get reimbursed separately for it. But if the drug is not on the pass-through status, then you will be reimbursed for it. Okay, that's great. Uh, there is a question for Ian. Uh, again, don't uh, read the names out, please. So what does the typical pain specialist have to do keep the doors open? Sorry, that is the wrong question. Oh, what real-world experience can the IPA share 
where the actual managed care and commercial contract has transpired into higher revenues and what can a typical pain practice expect in increased revenues by joining IPA? Great questions, and um, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of ifs and thens behind that in the answer. Um, some real world, real world um, examples and experience um, you know, come from the domain that, that I've been in as far as the IPA and that's been on the anesthesia side. Um, so some examples in that area, uh, which you know, uh, apply to uh, multiple specialties, was essentially looking at not only the, the fee schedule, but also um, the medical policies that surrounded the fee schedule. So a lot of the contracts are based upon Medicare or CMS. Um, one of the things we were able to do was to um, um, change the year um, that the contract was based upon Medicare fee schedule and Medicare policy. Um, so essentially turning back the clock. So a lot of contracts are, are written um, on current Medicare or current uh, CMS policy. Um, and we've been able to to renegotiate those contracts to bring it back and fix it to a year uh, that was most advantageous for the, the group as a whole. Uh, so reversing it to Medicare um, uh, 2005 or 2011, um, and essentially working with the insurer to uh, set that as the, the basis for the contract. And that typically had... Um, really um, unlocked a lot of uh, bundling that had taken place, but also um, the the rate structure. Um, we were seeing a lot of uh, cuts uh, from Medicare coming year over year from CMS, and as a result of re rewinding that clock, um, we were able to, and fixing it on a specific year, we were able to fix the revenue um, and hold it at that, that level. Um, the other thing we were able to do was is to um, change the locality as the setting for the um, the contract. So as you guys are familiar with, I'm sure the Medicare has a variety of different localities um, changing by state and even within the state where the rate schedules are adjusted um, based upon the, the relative um, cost of that area. So we were able to um, set the contract itself not only to a different year, but also to a different or specific locality, um, a locality that was much more advantageous for the, the group as a whole. Um, so those are some areas where, you know, we have been able to increase revenue um, through those negotiations. Um, as far as what can a typical team practice um, expect as far as increased revenue, it, it's a very tough question to answer. Um, it would depend upon the base at which you're at as far as where your fee schedules stand now. Um, and a, a lot of the different types of, of procedures that you're doing within the pain practice. Um, it, it's a tough one to do, but um, you know we can take an examination of the practice and look at the contracts where they stand now and then compare those to uh, contracts that we know um, exist with other parties um, in the area. So largely that's what we'll do is just essentially look at the, the fee schedules that large uh, conglomerates have been able to achieve uh, through consolidation or acquisition um, um, through venture capital firms and private equity firms. Uh, through this consolidation, they've been very aggressive in their contract negotiations with those insurance companies. Um, and uh, in some cases, um, they exist in different marketplaces where the IPA also uh, sits alongside those practices. And you know, we've been able to use that effectively to bring those rate schedules up to what those larger national um, um, consolidated uh, medical group practices have had. Um, so it, it's a tough one to say. Um, each practice is, is different, and um, the demographics of each practice you know range um, you know widely by you know, where you're at in the country and, and um, you know what um, what market you're serving. So I wish I had an answer for that, but um, I've seen them as 20% as, as to 30% in that area uh, where there's been a very effective IPA in place. Uh, there is a, another question for you. Please keep your answer to 
less than one minute. Uh, according to your forward facing IPA, are you saying you are going, we are going to join your group or are you buying the group practice or what does that mean? And in the same question, why don't you, why, why don't you have EMR systems with IT backup to make it truly awesome? <laughs> that's great. Um, that's a, a great question. EMR is an area that, that um, um, IPAs have, have negotiated great discounts. Um, and, you know, there's usually, you know, two or three that are common amongst um, single specialty IPAs. Um, and um, that's something that is, is one of those elements that put on the list and, and reach out to the vendors and, and start negotiating uh, and try to, to hit a price point that uh, the target uh, collectively agreed to by the, the IPA. Um, as far as the forward chasing, um, the, the reason the forward chasing has, has proven effective, and this has really come out of the, the private equity and the venture capital firms where they've acquired many practices and put them under a single tax ID. The insurers, believe it or not, they actually like to work with a single tax ID um, and um, have one type of communication. It makes their life a lot easier. Um, it also allows them to effectively manage their costs as far as interaction with those practices, but also um, you know, updating and, and advertising their, their increased network size and um, provider uh, network count. Okay, thank you. The next question goes to Dr. Devi and uh, Shalini. The recommendation to decrease steroids is based on the susceptibility susceptibility for infection or developing complications with COVID-19. I would like to add a comment before you answer the question. Actually, there is not that much evidence that the steroids are any more beneficial than steroids with local anesthetic. So there are so many randomized controlled trials and so many systematic reviews in general, we don't even use steroids in our practice, and now we don't even keep them available for the next three months. Now, Dr. Devi and Dr. Shalini, but both Dr. Devi, you want to go, or Shalini will go? Oh, well, I was just going to say for, for the steroids, from what I've seen, it's more a concern about immunocompromise, which the whole idea of our injections is that they're local, not necessarily affecting patients systemically. But that's most of the controversy I've seen. And, the, and then additional things about the use of PPE and if there is a complication, would people then have to go uh, to the ICU or, or to the OR for, uh, for surgery? Yeah, you know, um, so the recommendation, the specific question is, do we decrease steroids to contract the infection or to prevent complications? And the answer from our recommendations is to prevent complications from COVID. You cannot prevent um, your patient contracting the virus. So, but you can hopefully mitigate the risk of them de developing devastating sequelae. So that's the recommendation of decreasing the to the lowest therapeutic effective dose of steroid. Um, I just read a paper this morning showing that joint injection of corticosteroids may predispose patients to influenza. Um, so if we extrapolate influenza to COVID, maybe there is some um, there is some correlation there, but I'm, I'm not going to make that connection right now. But it's essentially the recommendation was so that your patient doesn't develop, um, you know, immunocompromise, which would predispose them to not fighting the infection properly. Okay, then next question is, how about doing Toradol shot during phase one? Should we or should we do or not for low moderate risk patients? Toradol injection. Yeah, I think that's re reasonable. Having the patient come into the office, you give a Toradol injection intramuscularly for low moderate risk, I think that's very reasonable. Um, there shouldn't be any significant harm that can, um, that can come from Toradol. Then uh, next question is uh, to Ian or uh, Maharshi or both, do you feel that states will be as stringent with private doctor clinics as with hospitals? 
it could be a prohibitive for private practitioners or could it be prohibitive for private practitioners? Maharshi? Um, well, I can add one thing. This is Devi. I was just going to say, you know, for us here, I have a private practice affiliated with NYU, and I've been trying to figure out how we can reopen. Uh, and some of the practical problems are that if we want to order supplies, it's very difficult to get anything. So if, you know, for example, if we wanted N95 respirators just for the employees, uh, it's still not possible to order it from the larger suppliers. They really will only allow hospitals who have previously placed those orders to get those supplies. Same thing with a lot of the PPE that you might want to have. Even simple things like hand sanitizers are hard to get infrared guns. We have the thermometers that are up close with the patients, but the ones where you would have them get checked at the door, those are hard to come by. So from a practical perspective, you know, we can stratify the patients, but as private practitioners, we may also have to look to see uh, how feasible is it to get enough of these supplies that we could uh, do this safely if we wanted to. And then also, you know, again, not to not to harp on malpractice, but we get a lot of these emails from our malpractice insurer that, you know, will patients be more likely to uh, sue you if you're in private practice versus under the auspices of a hospital system doing this? Okay. Uh, anybody else have any other questions? Answer for that in or Maharshi? Uh, yeah, just for the thing in, in our experience, um, and, and to to her point, um, we found that as as your purchasing power grows, um, you move up the ladder within the sales agent organizations at the pharmaceutical companies as well as the supply companies, and that um, those sales agents have a, a great deal of influence over who gets what and how fast they get it. Um, but definitely with, through purchasing power, um, you do move up that sales line. I've, I've witnessed that in, in the, um, uh, when the lactate brainers were, were disappearing off the market and um, the one that haunts me the most is when propofol was disappearing. Um, you know, those were both situations where we saw that we were able to access and get uh, these items um, just because we were much higher up on the sales chain as far as sales management at these um, pharmaceutical and supply dealers uh, because we had such purchasing power. Yeah, and to add on to what Ian was saying, uh, we've experienced a similar trend at all of the practices that we're working with. Um, unfortunately, uh, the trend is exactly what Ian was describing, where we're seeing Larger practices, which have a history of purchase, being uh, being given preference to these materials and this PPE ahead of the smaller groups that didn't have a history of purchasing these in the past. Okay, there is a question. This is a very complicated question. Probably Amol and I can answer this. So it says that practices have cut pay to employed physicians uh, by not to 80%. Uh, and also furloughed or simply let go of providers. While the practices continue to receive government financial assistance, these employees are not seeing any of it and continue to suffer. Contracts are not being honored and there seems to be no legal recourse. So far, I have not seen unemployment benefits and can't get stimulus money because of income in the last quarters. Practices need to remember that providers have families that depend on them uh, it goes on. We agree with that. If somebody is doing such radical steps, uh, that is really bad. But there is also a lot of misunderstanding in reference to what we are getting. Stimulus is the only um, money which is grant. Everything else is a loan. So it is going to be repaid. So it is not a panacea for employers. Some employers are worried about it and they're not taking and not applying for PPP, they, they're not quite certain that it will become a grant. So that is a major issue. What we have done in our practice is that what comes as a grant, we, in reference to the HHS grants, we will go ahead and allocate that amount for that physician, whatever was based on that, based on their formula, what they were getting before that, 
for this year, but we, have ne we haven't reduced anybody's salaries. We are paying the same amount of salaries with same amount of benefits for all employees. Amol, do you want to comment? Yeah, sure, I'd be happy to. Um, so it's interesting because when you look at the CARES Act, that stimulus money was actually um, earmarked for providers, right? Uh, and it was a provider relief fund where that money came out of. Um, the problem is, is the word provider wasn't actually defined. So in our local hospital, it's actually board week in our hospital, so we talked about this exact issue. The hospital administrators feel like they are the providers of service. Uh, not the doctors that they employ. So because that wasn't defined legally, I don't know if you have a legal recourse, to be honest. I think it's kind of up to whoever gets the money for you. So if you're employed, that entity is getting that money, and it's kind of up to them to be able to distribute it um, to you. And, and that's challenging if they say no or, or don't want to do that. Um, our hospital, interestingly, also at the board meeting, they said, you know, 50% uh, of our physicians voluntarily took a pay cut. Uh, thank you to all the physicians that did that. But that's a funny statement because the way it was presented to the doctors, they said, we'll either furlough you or you can volunteer to take a pay cut, right? So um, that's not really volunteering. But the problem is, is your legal recourse is only as good as what your contract signed has. And because this pandemic really hasn't happened in 112 years, very few, very few employment contracts have provisions to manage pandemics. Um, so that leads you up to the hospital itself making discussions on how they want to handle things. And they're going to, you know, obviously advocate to make as much most money for themselves as possible. So um, your self-interest may not be uh, able to be realized. Um, the only recourse you would have is if you have anything in your contract that forces the hospital to act. But I can pretty much promise you they probably looked at that before they took action to lower your salary to make sure they could do it. Uh, but, you know, you can always consult a lawyer and see. Uh, that's my opinion. Thank you. So, Amol, so you are, I was accurate that only grant you are getting is from HHS. Uh, the PPP is repayable unless you meet all the criteria and the bank recommends that it is repay that you it can it can be made into a grant so it is not like you take the money and move away with it it is allocated for payroll expenses and if you borrow medicare advance advances you have to pay it back it is just a interest free loan so that is the one we are trying to extend the payment duration is that correct yeah, that's completely accurate. And we don't know what's going to happen with those PPP loans. I mean, uh, I think it's going to be tough for the banks to do a lot of monkey business just because there's so much media attention and so many eyes on it. Uh, and, you know, the rule of law has been published in multiple different areas. So it's important for you to follow the rule of law to a T. Um, and if you if you don't, uh, yeah, that could make your money vulnerable to pay back plus 1%. But if you do, uh, follow the rule of law to a T. I just can't imagine um, the banks having a lot of leverage to do something um, to you or force you to pay it back. Um, just the optics of that would be difficult. So the important thing for you guys to know that got the PPP loan is to make sure you're following all of the um, guidelines and, and rules that are um, there to make it pay back, to make it payable back, right? So 75% of it has to be used for payroll, um, and 25% can be used for other things. You have to make sure you maintain your employee headcount and, and, you know, all the other rules in there. I think Harold is actually going to talk about that, just a little teaser for the next webinar. Um, he's going to go over for a few minutes uh, in the next webinar uh, important uh, pearls and tidbits that you guys need to know uh, as ASAP members to make sure you make it into a forgivable grant. So please tune into the next webinar. Well, I'm quite certain that, that there will be unprecedented oversight by Congress on these PPPs, but the fact is that it is a loan. It is not a grant, and it is not for distribution to employees. It is to use it for payroll. That is where a lot of misunderstanding is coming, so both sides have to be extremely careful on that aspect, and right now some of the banks are not issuing them properly, one of my friends, uh, he was talking to me that he applied and he got only like 50% of what he thought was eligible according to his accountant and everyone. So these things are going on. Next question is for Amol the, uh, and Shalini. 
The guidelines discussed today were fantastic. As a solo pain physician, I ended up forming an alliance with other Nevada ASIP members in setting up local guidelines for injections. Can we create regional guidelines that state ASIP presidents can promote and implement? Uh, Amol? Yeah, so I'll start with that. And one of the things I mentioned in my talk is uh, you're going to see um, some differences happening in ASIP regionally. So this coming year, we're going to do an extensive amount locally through your state presidents and state organizations as far as pushing uh, information to you guys that is pertinent to you locally. Um, secondly, to the uh, physicians who wrote those guidelines, uh, Geez, you know, we'd certainly love to see them, too, um, if you're willing to share them to, to someone at ASIP so we can take a look at them. One thing that we're going to be doing is this is the first in a series of deliverables. So you're going to get the frequently asked questions, the informed consent form to use before procedures or to consider using, as well as the uh, flow chart and the risk stratification guideline. Um, additionally, you're going to see us um, put together a manuscript that will sort of go over more comprehensively the methodology um, of the guidelines, uh, as well as some pro and con uh, arguments for doing various procedures, um, as well as a section on telemedicine. Uh, we think that these will be valuable tools, but we're always looking for more tools. So if you guys have one that you've created, um, you know, we'd be happy to look at that. Um, and if it's pertinent to you regionally, um, yeah, it'd be good for your state president to distribute it. Uh, Nevada is on my list of states to contact, which I will be. Um, I, I made it a goal to try to reach out to every state president by phone. And if I can't reach them by phone, a personal email. Um, so I will be reaching out to the Nevada team by Monday. Um, so I look forward to working with you guys on that as well. I'm sure uh, Shalini will work with them and help. Uh, we are running out of time. I have one question uh, for Randy. Randy Alvarez, and how do you yes. fight negative online reviews? One minute. Yeah. The answer well, is one minute, sir. <laughs> I'll, I'll do that. The uh, number one, I would get a company like Bird BirdEye is one of them, and they're a service that sends an email or a, and a text or a text or email to your patients for Google reviews and other online reviews. The Really, the only answer to this is to bury it with good reviews. You know, there was a survey with Gallup of why do good doctors get sued and bad doctors don't, and oftentimes it has to do with the personality of the doctor. Some people are just more likable than others, and I've met some, you know, and, I, and this is a challenge everywhere. So I would say to bury it, use a company like BirdEye that populates it for you, does all the work for you, so you don't have to go around asking patients for those um, those uh, referrals or those, uh, uh, you know, nice things to say on Google. That's, that's it. Thank you very much. Uh uh, we are close to be finishing. I want to thank everyone for their patience. We lost about 180 pay people from registration from attending because of the change. And remember, there will be a next webinar is on Wednesday, 29th, and the one after that is on May 5th, May 5th 2020. You already saw the schedule for May 29th. It is going to be exciting. Shalini is going to talk more about these guidelines, and we are also going to have an infection disease specialist talking about corona in patients, staff, and physicians, and how to prevent it. We will also have revenue cycle management, and our president is going to talk, ASIC president. And on Tuesday, May 5th, uh, Senator Cassidy will be here, and Dr. Devi will be talking about uh, uh, internet marketing, I think, and uh, we will have a lecture on time ma management, and Sunny Ja will be talking. Dr. Devi can talk on any subject. If you watch her on Fox News, you would know, or any news. So, again, thank you all, and good night. Very Robert. good. And that is all the time for tonight. On behalf of ASAP, I'd like to thank our attendees for your participation. We'd also like to thank our speakers for the excellent presentation. At this time, I do ask that you fill out the brief survey that will appear on your screen. Your feedback is greatly appreciated. This concludes tonight's webinar. We hope you have a great